and I'm sure we'll be joined by others, hopefully, uh, momentarily. Um, Sounds great. Yeah. Uh, bang, bang. All right, we got... Oh, I'm liking your hair, by the way. It's very cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting out of control. I'm in it's serious just envy. Like it's very different than the hair that I remember. <laughs> it is very different than the hair that everyone remembers. Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, yeah. But it's uh, yeah, it's kind of liberating in a weird way. <laughs> well, guys, yeah. we're we're live. Um, Rich, right. Vreeland, welcome to the show, man. Thanks, Clayton. It's good to be here. Uh, yeah. So, so um, for for those of of the people at home who don't know, uh, your work and not only just you as Rich Vreeland, but also uh, as Disaster Piece. Tell the people uh, kind of how they would know you. Yeah, so um, I started making music as a teenager, got into video games, like video game covers, and then through that discovered chip tunes. Then um, actually went to, I went to a chip tune show in New York City in 2005, maybe. And actually, Glomag was playing at the show. It was the first show I ever went to. I think you were on the set with Null Sleep and Anna Monaguchi and um, Bubbly Fish, maybe. Holy shit, I don't remember this. Was this at uh, the tank or was it like something else? I think it was at the tank, yeah. yeah that makes sense. Amazing. Yeah, so that was like kind of my introduction to that space. And um, uh, yeah, I was sort of like, I was kind of in a different trajectory i was doing graphic design and i decided to drop out and do music and um just didn't really know what i was doing but i knew that i loved making music um kind of got into realized that music production was way too complicated for me as a teenager and i just like discovered chip tunes and kind of went down that route for a long time um and then kind of found my way back to games and i've done i've worked on lots of games and movies and tv shows mostly scoring but also i do a lot of programming um and sound design and stuff like that so excellent uh we're joined by mike hall who's right above you there um, hello mike mike hey, um cool uh, yeah i wanted to, i was going to ask you a bit about your um your background but you pretty much covered that i mean uh i think i probably game aware of you right around that time uh, i the first track i heard by you was a collaboration with spamtron uh, uh spamtron which was the disaster tron uh was wow lola twerp is that the name of the song? lola twerp yeah deep That's cut all, yeah. <laughs> I was just playing it uh for clayton <clears throat> jumped in but that was yeah. back when it was easy to uh to make that kind of sound with the uh, the singing uh, that particular speech synthesizer is no longer available is that right? Uh, yeah, the developer who who uh, he passed away, and um, so you it, it, like so like I think there's actually there's a bunch of records from like the early aughts, late nineties that use that same software, and um, mm -hmm. now you need to run like an old computer to even use it, wow. like a like a very old computer. <laughs> yeah, break out the right. emulators, man. Yeah, but it, yeah, Lola's Warp was very um, a very unusual kind of one off thing that we did that. Uh, was pretty fun <laughs> super catchy and i just love the melody um it's one of those melodies that kind of go don't they repeat but they repeat after a very long iteration of the melody you know so it's really yeah fun because it takes you a few listens to learn the whole melody in your head and then you can kind of sing along with it um but yeah i, I really love it um thank you was, yeah <laughs> the beginning but um so yeah, I remember obviously seeing you at shows. I saw you at Magfest um, back in the day. I don't know. God, that was probably the last time I saw you perform was at Magfest with um, Roger. Um, um, I'm trying to remember his artist. Recadam. Recadam. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that was excellent. That was so much fun. Or was that Eight Static Festival? God, I can't remember now. We played it both. So yeah, I, um, I think it. I think Eight Static was more recent. That would that would have been 2013, yeah. which yeah. is. Uh, and I haven't really done any live shows in the last like six six years or something. I bet. Well, you're pretty. Busy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, so, were you? What was it like? Were you early on? Like you you told us about how you got into game music, just doing games, video game soundtrack covers. Um, when did you get into film music? When did you start thinking about film music? Um, and and how 
what struck you about like what was, how it was different from chip tune and from just video game music um you know in I, yeah i kind of um i kind of got pulled into film it was never really like i was always open to it but it wasn't really my focus my focus was always games and then um i, I worked on this game fez and the the this director really liked the score to, to that game and uh reached out to me and to, to score his his horror movie and i'd never done any films and i had very little like familiarity with with horror in general um and i was also really busy at the time and i actually like said no a bunch of times uh it took us it took me a while to kind of come around and basically agree to do it um that was david, and, robert, david robert mitchell david robert mitchell yeah, yeah. and then yeah. obviously um it, it wasn't like it turned out good it turned out really good and the reception was was really surprising um just like you know first first movie project and hey everybody loves it yeah, you uh, have a real knack for it i think <laughs> yeah cool. i think so yeah um it's it's one of my favorite horror soundtracks really uh, of all time i mean i just i really it's it's wow the the pieces are iconic but they're also there's a lot of mood there's a lot of very heavy mood um mm -hmm. melodically it's really interesting um your Thank chord you. structures and your your chord kind of harmonic movement in your pieces has always really fascinated me. By the way, we're joined by um, Tamara Yadal, aka Corset Lore. I think you met Tamara at a show at some point. It was, probably eight static. Okay. Yeah, a long time ago. <laughs> nice to, to see, see you. You look you too. You look familiar. <laughs> yeah. So Tamara's yes, yes. and electronic stuff is Corset Lore. So yeah, cool. she's one of our musical uh, musical. Um, Powerhouses, and, yeah, and powerhouses. Awesome. Um, she also plays a role in Mandible Judy, which is our, uh, the podcast that we're all a part of. Um, mm -hmm. Awesome. So, um, yeah, it follows really struck me that, and I think you know. So, did that lead to a lot of other film work at that point? It led to a lot of opportunities that I mostly um, turned down. Um, uh, there, there was a lot of uh, you know. Um, a lot of other opportunities to do horror films um but a lot of it was like very a lot of like slasher movies and stuff like that and i didn't really think that that was the direction i wanted to go in and i also didn't want to be pigeonholed because i just did one movie and i didn't want to like suddenly just become the the horror music person um like i've always liked to kind of like play the field and experiment and explore different like styles so um yeah there were it, it was i mean there were a lot of like pretty there are a lot of interesting opportunities there was i think a saw project that that was potentially gonna happen that i that i decided not to do stranger things was the big yeah. one um right. that i decided not to do uh <laughs> do, do you, you have regret on that, that or are you like <laughs> yeah i mean that, you didn't know at the time right that it was going to be this huge thing no i i had no idea um but i mean i read the script and i you know saw one of their previous movies and i like thought about it and i was like it's very spielberg -y and i don't like i didn't really like the movie that they had made so i just decided not to do it um it was also really soon after it follows that that, that i got um that they reached out to me so um well i i dare i say i mean i i, I like the soundtrack to stranger things fine the the guys who did it are a couple of austin uh, people are, are they, yeah they're very nice uh, i've met them before okay nice i've guys. never met them but um but I, I have to say like i think if you had done it it would have sidestepped the very tropey i mean the the the, the series itself mm -hmm. is loaded with horror tropes and i think that's the whole point it's just mm -hmm. yeah one big hauntological remember this you know? it's like <laughs> goonies it's like a goonies horror yeah. horror yeah. movie yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And I think if you record it, it would have it would have pulled it out of that just enough to make it much mm. more interesting to me. Um, yeah, I, I when I when I've seen like bits of it, I, I wonder about um, what the structure was with the music direction because I felt like from what I saw that the way that the music was was handled was not how I would have gone about it, and um, there was like the music was often kind of in the background exactly in, in moments that I felt like the music should be really forward. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's one of the most that's one of the best things that that I appreciated about my collaborations with David Mitchell is that he really um, pushed for having the music really be front and center. Um, mm. I mean, and it follows the way that that movie is shot is very sort of like naturalistic and there's a lot mm. of space. So mm. the music just has all this room to really come in and like be 
like another character and just kind of be really loud and, and kind of intense. And I think that actually helps mm -hmm. with um, creating the, the vibe of that movie. Well, when you've Excellent. got, and, and this is certainly true of your, I think notably true of your work, your, your, despite the, what I think a lot of people will term as a limited palette from a, a sound or, or at least a bit depth, right? Your, you talk about his chip tune work. I mean, yeah, I've done your, orchestra, orchestral your, your, work. And, your compositions yeah. are always incredibly <laughs> yeah. moody and incredibly emotional, and they've got this huge range. So mm -hmm. even when you're operating in a very small palette, you tend to operate in ways that I think a lot of people who get into a particular genre will just say, okay, well, here's what you know mm -hmm. the genre expects, and this is all I'm going to deliver, whereas yours tend to fall outside that, and I think in, in a mm -hmm. positive way, not in a, oh, what is this? Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess I, I don't know. I, it it helped in the case of it follows and some of the other projects I've done, um, like the other movie that I did with Mitchell under the Silver Lake, both genre movies that I where I came in basically um, green. Like I didn't really have any, I didn't have a lot of experience or familiarity with those genres, and I think that process actually helped me because it allowed me to have fresh ears and kind of put in put just just because I was kind of a noob but like it, it it just made it automatically kind of a fresh spin on it um, mm -hmm. because I was just kind of figuring it out and um uh yeah I don't know and I, I guess for me like I never tried to accomplish particular like sounds or something like that it's more like let me especially on those projects it was like having strong collaborators who have like a really good template for what they're looking for like the temp scores for both of those movies are really really strong and and um i kind of like just tried to internalize what they were doing like functionally and then kind of forget about the specifics and just try to write um with those ideas in mind but kind of take it in my own try to take it in my own direction i guess can you explain to the audience some of our audience might not know what a temp score is can you explain what that means yeah yeah, so uh, in movies and television, um, a lot of times uh, they will cut the film or the show to um, reference material, like reference music, um, because it's sort of like they're workshopping ideas and it's not always practical to have a composer writing all this music to <laughs> these scenes that are constantly changing. Some composers some composers work that way. Uh, personally, I, I find that to be... Um, a bit much because you end up writing, you know, five, ten times as much music as actually gets used, and right. it's just kind of insane. <laughs> so I really like it when they. I personally like working from a temp score. Um, I think if you have the right mindset for it, you can do really good work. You just have to be careful that you're not like, you know, adhering to it too closely, or um, it can also there can be like certain. You can run into issues with directors who are really attached to certain pieces of music and that kind of thing yeah yeah it, it yeah that is a thing where yeah it's like well you, i got the mood and i hope they and they, they're like they no, they we just they don't just don't see it sometimes they're like oh, yeah the, the well, mood is enough it has to be the same damn piece of music you know yeah exactly it's like nothing you do you can do the best thing ever it's not going to matter because they're just attached to something and it's actually funny because on it follows um like half of the film was tempted with music from fez like a game a game that i scored oh awesome <laughs> so that made it really that made things really weird and challenging because i had to try to like outdo a like a former version of myself in in his eyes and yeah it just it made it a little bit awkward at times but um for the most part we, we managed to figure it out <laughs> i can i can kind of see the i can see the inspiration a little bit in there but they're mm -hmm. very obviously very different i mean fez yeah. has a lot more mood mood wise it's a lot more kind of spacious and just kind of um contemplating and kind of yeah. you know experiencing you know and yeah and it follows is very dramatic um there's know. just a couple of cues in fez that are that have a darker kind of tone um yeah. that that mitchell kind of honed in on like there's right. this track death, death in fez, right. which <laughs> was basically <laughs> that was basically the the stand-in for the for the theme song of the movie um oh wow that's yeah. amazing i would love to see that cut in to see how it works <laughs> <laughs> It worked. Yeah, it, it pro probably worked pretty good. Yeah. I was gonna say there's a. I noticed that there's um a lot of similarity for me in just some of the textures. 
you know, just from from Fez, and also in It Follows, like some of your yeah. kind of noisier textures, which I actually really like so much because um, it's kind of it's a very unique sound, I guess. I just have not heard noise um, used, I mean, just created in that way yeah. before. So I think Thank that's you. kind of pretty cool. Um, I was sort of pushed in that direction, I think, because because the, the, the temp score being from Fez, a lot of it, you know, it kind of pushed me in that direction where I was always trying to make it as different as possible, but there was sort of this like figuring out the in between where I was happy and, and the director was happy. And so a lot of like the techniques from Fez kind of a lot of them ended up on on the it follows score too. Very That's cool. nice though, because I mean it's still kind of like you're being hired for your work, not, you know, as like you were brought in as somebody who whose work, you know, the director liked and wanted, you know, your kind yeah. of style and your sort of approach. So that's that's ideal, actually. I think as as an artist um, yeah. coming into film, that was your first one, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, there's definitely yeah. it's definitely great to work with somebody who wants to work with you specifically. Um, the the yeah. the only issue that I run into sometimes is people want you to do the same thing you did already. Um, and for me personally, like my what motivates me is doing things that are different. So, um, if someone's really keen on having me like recreate the same kind of sound uh, that can be um, a bit of a struggle for me. Mm -hmm. I'd say. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of artists who, um, you know, composers and, and just artists, you know, that are represented in galleries and whatnot, you know, they, they get picked up a lot for certain things that they did. And I've known people in the past that have, have said, you know, I have to, uh, I had to break up with my gallerist because, you know, they were saying, can you recreate those sculptures you did, you know, 10 years ago? And, you know, she was like, no, I can't. I'm, I'm like not there anymore. I'm like at a completely yeah. different place in my process and my life. So, more, so that's more power, that. More power to her to take the stand, yeah. you know. It's not always yeah, yeah, easy totally. to do, especially if you're like trying to, you know, make a living or whatever. Right, right. No, totally. Yeah. There's, a true. there's apparently a moment uh, where, and it's a, a horrible movie, but Kevin Smith directed <laughs> Top Story or whatever it was with Bruce Willis and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wrote a, a portion of that scene where he basically wanted Bruce Willis to call back a particular role from Moonlighting, I think it was. Um, <laughs> and uh, he was trying to walk around it and walk around it and walk around it and get sort of Bruce Willis to just kind of fall into the role by just mentioning things tangentially related and Bruce I guess goes <laughs> so, so you want me to, yeah he goes so you want me to, to just do that scene again from Moonlighting and uh Kevin was like I mean yeah if you don't if you don't mind um and Bruce oh, goes so all right well, that's that's fine <laughs> but this is your one take and apparently <laughs> it became like this really content that from that point forward, it became super contentious during the entire recording for the exact reason you just mentioned. Don't, <laughs> don't ask me to go back to 30 years ago or 20 years ago, whatever it was and rehash something I did. It's old and stale now. Give me something new. Um, yeah. Uh, ugh, yeah. It's funny how that carries across. I guess it's not funny. It's appropriate that that carries across through all the different sort of walks of life and so on. But yeah, I find it frustrating because I want the collaborators that I work with to be um, to be proactive and to be thinking about like, oh, I have this like talented person I'm working with and I, I want to like channel them to do something new and, and interesting as opposed to like, oh, I already decided that I want this thing that already exists. And like, I guess from my perspective, it's like, if you want that, like try to go get the li licensing to that or something. And <laughs> yeah. like, why, why am I doing it? Like this right. already exists like i don't understand yeah um like to me the whole joy of like making stuff with people is is the collaboration and like reaching new territory together as opposed to like retreading For sure. stuff mm -hmm. uh, to that yeah. same end what's the is there a is there a a different thing so that scratches the itch for you doing film scores versus video game scores i noticed just in your discography you've got a lot more video game uh play yeah my preference is working on games um i would say i got 
kind of pulled into film and saw it as an interesting opportunity and decided to, to try it for a while. And um, overall, um, I just I find that there are other things that I would rather do. Um, and a lot of it has to do with just the logistics of film uh, and TV, the culture. Like, there's a lot about it that I don't like. Uh, <laughs> it's very, it gets very complicated because there's always tons of people involved and lots of different organizations. And then it could, so it's very political. There's a lot of, there's a lot of like self preservational behavior. Producers you never meet making decisions about your work. Like, it's mm -hmm. just, it's a lot of backdoor kind of stuff. Um, and, Fortunately, um, I, you know, I've been able to work on smaller projects that have been successful. And so I'm in a position where I could continue to do that. And so mm -hmm. um, going forward, that's kind of what my plan is, is to, to work on smaller projects and to work on less commissions and to focus more on like personal, personal projects. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe there's like a cool movie or show or something down the line that I want to do. But in general, um, I, I, I tend to be more motivated these days by like music technology stuff and you know i have i have a ton of personal projects that i just been like collecting dust like old like music and music software and all kinds of stuff like that so that's kind of where my focus is right now mm -hmm. um i wanted to ask you a question rich about i mean uh you know we, we i want to i mean i feel like we could take some time on this particular topic the the orchestral scores that you've done um but mm. before we get into it have you done a, an orchestra, orchestral score for a video game? I know it's not done very often, but yeah, I mean, I did, yeah. I did, I did like a stylistically an orchestral score, but it wasn't with a live orchestra. Mm -hmm. um, I scored this game maybe five or six, six or seven years ago, called Cannon Brawl, which is mm -hmm. like a spinning plates multiplayer type game where you have a blimp and you're like flying around and you're like managing different like units that do different things like shields and cannons and stuff like that. And uh, I did this sort of like orchestral march, um, marching music type music. Uh, and that was my pretty much my first like proper like orchestral project. So I just kind of got like a little taste of it. Mm -hmm. And then um, when I had the opportunity to actually work with an orchestra, I decided to, you know, kind of dive much deeper into it. Um, do you want to talk about that process a little bit? I mean, I know that it's, yeah. uh, I mean, I guess to me, the thing, I've, I, having never done it, um, having written stuff for orchestra, but sampled orchestra, you know, orchestral yeah. arrangements, um, mm -hmm. I, I, what fascinates me and kind of makes me scared is the, is the way is you basically have to really give up a lot of yeah. control. I mean, you really have to give up a lot of control. Yeah. So how did that work? For you yeah so i guess my approach was to try to have my cake and eat it too in the sense that <laughs> i tried to like make my demos as good as humanly possible to the mm. point where i'd basically be happy like almost happy like just you know going with the demo mm. and then i would we'd orchestrate for um you know we'd prepare to to have an orchestra record record those pieces and um you know, if they were able to do something much better than, than I was able to do, like in the box, like then great, and we'd replace it. Other, you know, there were times where things they did didn't really work um, aesthetically and we had to pull it. We did a lot of um, what they call striping, which is where you like take out sections and you record them separately. Mm -hmm. So you might just record the brass or just the strings or individual parts, variations. Like we did a lot of that kind of stuff too, so that we had flexibility and um, you know, it's sort of like this living, breathing organism and you have limited amount of time because you're basically like burning money. Like every moment you're in a studio with, a, with like 50 musicians. So, For sure. um, yeah. we just tried to, we just tried to like, you know, uh, like fly through all the tracks. And then if we had extra time, we'd like, oh, could you guys just like, mm, do this one thing, like, you know, play this chord, like, and I'd experiment with like, uh, having the brass players use different mutes or, you know, uh, just like w I try to use up all the time and come up, you know, like anything that right. we could gather, like grab bag that could help with mm -hmm. basically um, because not only was I going to get the orchestral performances mixed um, and to, to reincorporate them into the demos, which is what we ended up doing. But also um, uh, it, I kind of 
approached it like collaging where you know there were there were performances where you know we we had things separated a little bit so you know we'd take this part we'd you know we'd, we'd use the brass we wouldn't use the strings um, gotcha. there were times where like people um the orchestral um the first chair violinist who's also the contractor for the orchestra um you know he was he, he would like come up with ideas sometimes <laughs> we had a lot of people like like trying to help make the process smooth and sometimes it was a little like too much but you know there were times where like where like you know um kyle the orchestral producer and i kyle is as a film composer as well and he helped me a lot with logistics um we'd be like this isn't really working like what can we do the orchestra the first chair violins would be like oh i know what we can do like what if we what if we do this section this way like just violins and so there would be things where um we would have to change you know, we we would have to change what we do on the fly, like not even writing it on the on the page. Like, let's right. just, you know, we're gonna do this. Um, uh, the, you know, we're gonna do this vibrato or whatever. Like this articulation, like right on the like right on the stand or on the stick, they call it. Um, on so. the stick. So yeah. <laughs> to that, appropriately enough, did they? Did you come with a conductor, or did you get to go in there and? Oh God! I mean, I, I, I think I technically could, but um, it's been a long time since I took conducting in college, so I think it would be a total disaster if I tried to like, like, hey, it's been like you know twelve years, but I think I could do this. So we, we, uh, we, we had like a proper conductor. And the few which, times I've been in the studio without a like not being an engineer with a band or whatever like that, it is. It's like the old Price is Right, Price is Right timed things where you hit the buzzer, okay, go, and you have you know, 60 seconds to do everything you got to do and you got to get it all done. And if you have any time left over, yeah, I know yeah. exactly that time crunch. I know that yeah. how you're talking we about had, that. I think we had nine hours, two, three, three hour sessions. Mm -hmm. We had to do, yeah. we had to hit a rate of, of, of like recording. So it's like a big, there's a big strategic meeting about like, okay, what's the order that we record these in? We have to start with the pieces that need the entire orchestra so that yeah. we can send people home and save yeah. money like there's all this crazy stuff that goes into it we had to like hit like eight minutes of music per hour um so it's like it's very like intense but it's super exhilarating and is the most fun by far the most fun i've had working on movies is is being in the recording studio yep awesome and and they they are viewing and listening to the dialogue in the scene as well at the same time or not necessarily not necessarily um i think I think for Under the Silver Lake, we piped in the visuals of the film, mm -hmm. um, but it didn't always work because sometimes there were technical errors, like it'd be out of sync or something. I think on Triple yeah. Frontier, we didn't even do that, um, if I recall correctly. That that score we we recorded more like in in sections, like we we rarely like had the whole orchestra. It was more like oh, mm -hmm. we have like a string section and a brass section, and we'll like you know we'll we'll mm -hmm. be strategic about. Oh, this piece we might want to add some brass. This piece we might want to add some strings. So it's more like over. It was like overdubs almost. Okay, and were you were you uh, involved in the editing of like I imagine the editing must have been a big part of the the creativity here, um, but because you're taking things that are not always in sync with each other, lining them up almost like a sound collage, right? Yeah. In some cases. Yeah, basically the orchestral recordings would get mixed by like an orchestral mixer. Um, actually, okay. I worked with um, um, this guy, Damien, whose last name I can't remember, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, his dad was in the Wrecking Crew, <laughs> if you know the oh, Wrecking Crew. Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Damn. Um, that's, uh, that's very cool deep. guy. Uh, and uh, then, so he would send send me the stems of the, of the orchestra, and then I would, you know, I would go through them and reintegrate them into the into the pieces um because the pieces like we record the orchestra but sometimes the movie is still shifting and scenes are changing and things are getting readjusted so i have to like you know there's a lot of um finagling that has to happen <laughs> with right. the timing of but you still you still end up giving um the re-recording mixer a final stereo mix of all the music Right. Or do you sometimes give them stems so they can then bounce yeah. they can play around even more? It's pretty mixer. it's pretty standard these days to, to give them stems. Um, they ask for okay. they want categories. So like, you know, percussion, bass, uh, strings, it. that sort of thing. It's usually what they want. 
Makes sense. <laughs> on wow. Triple Frontier, they had they had their own they had their own stems for Lars Ulrich's drumming. <laughs> I was going yeah. to ask you about Lars Ulrich. I was going to ask yeah. you about I mean, not just about Lars Ulrich, just in the hiring of the musicians. I mean, do you guys? I mean, do you yourself have you know say in that? And I mean, I would assume that if you know particular players that you want you know a sound from, that yes, you could you know, hire them if you wanted to. Yeah, I think for the most part, the players is kind of up to me. And by proxy, I would bring in somebody to help me with that because I don't really, I'm still sort of an outsider. Like I've, I've only done that whole thing twice. So I, the people that I worked with on Under the Silver Lake are the same people that I brought in on, um, on Triple Frontier. Um, sometimes, sometimes things are complicated politically and maybe you you you're sort of persuaded to hire certain people over other people because you know it's gonna protect you or something like it can get complicated but um for the most part like the nitty-gritty of like musicians there's usually you know you can pretty much hire who, who you want um unless there are also like union things that you have to keep into consideration too like whether or not it's going to be a whether or not it's going to be a union gig um <laughs> which is a big a big thing especially in LA. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um so, with, so with, oh go yeah go ahead Chris. No, go ahead, okay. No, no, I was just so I, I mean I'm sure everybody is curious but um so did you did you want Lars Ulrich on on um the score for Triple Frontier then? Just I mean as far as his you know like <laughs> <It's a person. laughs> I mean no, no I mean, just I mean it's like his double bass work and you know <laughs> and, uh, his his pizzazz yeah uh, yeah you know it, it was not it was not my idea uh, <laughs> oh, okay. well, nice. it was it was not my idea but um lars is is awesome he was awesome like i it was it was the best part of that project um maybe outside of the recording studio i mean we'll go in, going in the recording studio with him was super fun too um i had a blast because i got to go to metallica headquarters um uh, which was amazing it was so cool uh and he's just the nicest guy he's really fun and um yeah it wasn't my it wasn't my decision it it, it was sort of a political thing um but in high i mean i i was glad to collaborate with him um it was really fun and i think what he did like added it added something um for yeah. sure so uh, it was cool I'm glad to hear that he's a good guy because I had heard I worked in music for like 10 years, live sound and studio sound and metal and worked with a lot of different people. I never got to work with them, but I saw them live like three times, you know, before I get into it. And I had heard a lot of rumors that he was difficult to work with, but I'm glad mm. to hear that he wasn't for you. Yeah, I mean, who knows? I mean, maybe he was. He's he's been around for a long time, so yeah. I'm sure right. I'm sure he's grown up a bunch. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. He's um he's also a, a, a well known as a, an art collector, which is interesting. I, I do a lot of um I used to do a lot of audio for Christie's, the auction house, ah. and um they often interviewed their specialists and their art collectors, and he was one of them. And I was like, wait, the Lars Ulrich? You know, I'm editing audio <laughs> from a dialogue or whatever I interview with him, and yeah, it's kind of cool because I got to see him in this whole different you know incarnation, like talking about um. God, I remember what I think it was um, Paul McCarthy or somebody like that, some modern, you know, contemporary artist that he had collected mm. a bunch of stuff. Um, but, um, yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, I, I could see I it totally when I saw his name in the credits, I was like, yeah, that makes sense, because you rely a lot on kind of heavy percussive kind of underlying. Un, what's the word underlining of of bits and themes and, you know, yeah. Uh, it totally makes sense that he would he's got a very dramatic kind of you know percussive style um, yeah so and it was just it. like the, the way that it ended up working was it was just it was just kind of this like glue that went underneath everything um aesthetically mm -hmm. like the drums when they were out front it was like very different than the score so it was sort of like a balance to like figure out how to actually incorporate these very like you know heavy metal like studio studio drum sound um, with like digital reverb <laughs> kind of like sound like with like sort of the sound of the score um, but uh, I think um, especially on the on this on the soundtrack it really like adds adds a lot um, and so was that was that an overdub or was he in the room with you with the orchestra 
No, it was an overdub. Um, basically, okay. we, like picked you know a handful of cues that we thought would be good to have him kind of play to, and you know it was sort of an experiment because you know he had never. Um, I don't think he'd ever done anything like that. And he was really excited to be a part of a movie project because I don't think he'd ever, yeah, it, it was new to him and he loves movies. And, you know, I don't think he, it would have been appropriate to like, you know, ask him to like read this you know, sheet music and here's these prepared parts. You know, it was more like, we're going to play the track and like, you know, just, you know, do what you think feels good, you know? And, you weren't going to take um, the opportunity to crack the whip? <laughs> <laughs> not with not with those, are, those are not triplets. <laughs> That's yeah. not a triplet. You know, Lars, Lars, you were, Lars, you were a little late you. in that. Yeah. On that yeah. 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 That, that would have been great. I'm gonna need you to do that again, really Lars. This, I'm really liking this red going over one side of you here. It's very horror setup here. Oh yeah, I have I have red lights throughout my uh, apartment. It'll get worse the longer we talk. Nice. <laughs> it looks great. Thank you. Mood, mood music. I'm curious. Mm -hmm. Speaking of mood, and speaking of just scoring in general, uh, yeah. if you can talk a little bit about kind of how the sausage gets made when you're starting on a given piece, um, and you have you know whatever be that uh, the demo tracks or or um, the script, whatever the case is, maybe it's just concept art. Do you start with the particular section? Do you start with the rhythm? Do you start with uh, a, a melody do you start how like how, what's your general process when you're going through especially from a mood standpoint um it, it depends i definitely have certain kind of approaches that i've gravitated towards there one of the approaches though is also just to kind of iterate on the creative process itself and try something completely different mm -hmm. than i would normally do but mm -hmm. normally what i like to do is sit at the piano and um, just improvise a lot in the beginning and start to kind of get a sense for flavors and harmonic ideas. Um, and then there's sort of a separate kind of, you know, session where I will start kind of doing sound, build, like sound world type stuff, like collecting palette. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I do them at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I just write. I'll just start writing like in the DAW and like collecting sounds. Um, you know, I've written tracks where I start with drums. I've written tracks where I start with chords. Um, melody is probably the least frequent one that I that I lead with. Although I would like to do that more because you, it 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 yields different results. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I'm really yeah. keen on like trying different things to get different results because, in my experience, it really influences the way things turn out and you can get really wildly different things if you kind of turn the the process like on its head sure yeah. when you're when you're dealing with that palette selection do you have yeah. i mean i i've got to imagine just knowing that from a sound design standpoint that can be both its most enlightening and then and frustrating portion of a given project um mm. do you have like a, a collection of stuff that you rifle through and, and find or do you go out and find sort of new every time no i usually i usually collect sounds in my off time um so i have a lot of i have a lot of random stuff um i go through phases where i'm interested in a particular kind of thing and mm -hmm. like lately i've been really I, I got really into sound fonts which is like a just a weird treasure trove of stuff um a lot of it is like bad but some of it like in a, <laughs> but in a good way maybe uh, yeah, right. you can get we in can there and vintage. yeah, vintage. <laughs> but every once this in a while, terrible. Someone, terrible. You should hear it. Someone recorded this yeah. like one, you know, weird instrument really in a really funny way, and it sounds uh -huh. kind of cool and has a lot of character. So, um, yeah, I will like like lately on a recent project, I was literally just I had a folder of new stuff, and I was just like going through one by one, like maybe this would work, maybe this would work. Other times, I'm like, I want you know, this kind of instrument or, mm -hmm. or maybe I'm going to make a, make a synth patch from scratch or something. It kind of depends on, you know, mm. that's my project. Uh, and just to, to dive deeper into that from a super nerdy standpoint, like when you're, when you're playing with a sound, <coughs> are you yeah. going in there grabbing the sound and then fucking with filters and playing with delay and you know, all that? Or do you, do you just go mm, click play, let it see it. Uh, I don't like it and move on to the next bit. It depends. Uh, it depends on the aesthetic of the project, but 
but in a lot of cases i especially if i'm working with like samples or something i will like do a lot of things to it to get it to a place that i think is cool like mm -hmm. recently i was writing a track and um there was this drum it was like an old sound font of like a t turtle drum or something and i really liked the lowest velocity of it so i just i just deleted all the other velocities and i just you know use the lowest velocity across the whole keyboard uh -huh. and then i put like a convolution on it of like a i don't know like a nasa recording or something and it sounded like a weird like a like a steel drum or something um so i'll like sometimes i'll like find something and i'm like there's something to this and i don't know what it is yet but i'm gonna like i'm just gonna like fuck around with it a little bit and and um mm. see what happens i i do like to do that um other times you know if i'm like ah you know sometimes i get into this headspace of like i'm in the flow like i'm in the zone and i have to like I have to make sure that I'm like writing right now because I feel, I feel this momentum. And so yeah. I'll just like grab whatever and I'll be like, ah, so it really kind of depends on how much, um, how much mental pressure I'm feeling to like get this like, idea out before it goes away. Uh -huh. Sometimes I don't have that. And other times I do. Makes sense. Yeah. I, I definitely yeah. find that. Uh, and I, I, I guess a lot of composers feel this, that sometimes when you're writing the texture of something is what, piques your interest um or the timbre and you're you're like all about that timbre and you're like it doesn't matter what i play with this damn thing it sounds amazing and other yeah. times it's like well <laughs> it's all about the melody or it's all about the harmony or the bass line or whatever and 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 i can just swap this out for a different patch later on you know um yeah yes so yeah i tend to like i i've done a lot of work where i I take old recordings that I did, like I mean, literally, like stuff from that I wrote for the from the eighties. I mean, you know this because I had that <laughs> that project that you you helped back and and uh, yeah. we're t we were talking yeah. about it at one point with the old soundtracks from the eighties. And like, uh -huh. I love taking them and throwing them in, like basically making a, an audio track, right, and then just writing new MIDI material over top of it. And like, and then at the end, I decide how much of that original track really stays in there, whether I want to EQ certain things out. Um, mm -hmm. But it's super fun because it gives it like, like you were saying before, there's something about this sound that I like. There's some, and it, it's that vintage kind of a, the air around the sound, if that makes yeah. any sense. The space it that also it was recorded in. It also becomes like anachronistic in a weird way because it's like it exists in multiple time periods at the same right. time because right. <laughs> a lot of times you make something and it's like oh this is like a snapshot of like this particular moment when i made it or this yep. like window of time from like you know a week or a couple mm -hmm. of days so it can be cool to like revisit something and be like oh i'm gonna like you know i'm gonna add this whole different section or something and now it's like this cool frankenstein thing <laughs> yep yeah, I always think of it as I, I, I've, I've talked to people about this before, and I always think of it as a conversation with a younger version of myself. I yeah. mean, in this case, it's <laughs> much younger. Version. So, I mean, like I'm talking like 30 or 40 years younger. So it's a really strange thing because I'm like obviously not playing very well at that point in my life. <laughs> you know, everything <laughs> I'm performing, you know, uh, just on the fly is just really sloppy. Yeah. So I kind of sometimes I have to sample pieces and, and fix it and, you know, whatever and move it around mm -hmm. um, to make it palatable. But um, there is, yeah, there's something about that, that kind of antique quality of things. Um, the, I, or, or you could call it like kind of audio archaeology in a way. Like yeah. Like, like digging up these old, the quality of some old timbre from, you know, a different sometimes recording system that you there's just some weird magic to something and you can't even really describe why is it archaeology it or is it necromancy at that point i think it's necromancy <laughs> and i honestly think that, like, if right? i had a conversation with myself from back then i would be like what the fuck were you thinking god oh, what that is usually but you away. know what mike when you hit a certain i'm a little bit older than you I'm actually yeah. a bit older than you but but i i i can tell you for certain when you hit a certain age you're like I don't care about that anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was bad. It was bad. I've, I, I can live with yeah. it now. Are you okay now? I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. As long as you're okay like, now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, 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 I can so, do better now, thankfully. Yeah, Go better ahead, better tools, more experience. Absolutely. Um, to yeah, that same uh, end, when you're, when you're playing, there's, uh, I feel like I've seen in a lot of artists who now are kind of on the scene, they've come back to these... Um, the only one I can think of uh, from a brand standpoint off the top of my head is the Eurorack. 
where you've got this whole mm -hmm. bank of equipment and all the wires yeah. connecting back and forth to play with the different um, textures and so on. Do you prefer a digital format where you're playing with your DAW and you have, here's all my daubs and niles inside this, or do you like the more tactile kind of experience, experimentation thing? Daubs and niles. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, I, I noticed that too. You that said daubs like, and niles. Look, it's like awesome. a British, you just, you British just detective, detective unit. <laughs> you just go yeah, with it. It's a, uh, no, daubs and niles. Yeah, daubs and niles. Um, yeah, no, I... I <laughs> There's a, there's a term for that. It's a, um, oh fuck, I don't, the same guy. Spoonerism. There's a, spoonerism. Yeah. Well, that's there's, it. A, there's a spoonerism. Think, yeah, it? but there's a, um, yeah. there's another term. There's, so there's a guy who wrote, um, go to Lesherbach, who's then gone on to write uh, a bunch uh, yeah, of other right. ones, um, surfaces and essences, which is phenomenal, and where they actually talk about this thing. Uh, if oh, you're yeah. a geek into nuance, I highly recommend it. I wish I remember the guy's name. His last name is very difficult to pronounce i don't know what the hell it is but yeah. i've tried to get into that book numerous times and every time i kind of look at it i'm like oh i don't know which one i don't know if i <laughs> i don't know if my schedule's clear enough <laughs> which one <laughs> to get into this book uh, 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 uh girdle oh, escher bach it's it's huge yeah. yeah it's massive one well, it's heavy shit you're like oh here's here's <laughs> the nature of consciousness yes this piece of music yeah. is conscious what I think it's. I think it's okay. a bit. It's a bit too out. It might be a bit too out there for me. <laughs> it's uh, it's intense. The the it's surfaces and essences is, is pretty freaking cool. They get into that about li uh, linguistics and um, how all things are analogy, and that's sort of the the their, their mm. tagline is the fuel for fuel for thought is analogy. Um, and so they. That's cool. That's one of his hobbies is he collects when people fuck up a thing that I just did. He'll be like, "Oh, well, why did he do that?" Because his brain clearly put these things together in a particular way. Let's let's pull that in. They use when French I was a, a lot kid. When I was a kid, I always used to do this thing, and I don't know where it came from. Um, where I would ask people, "What comes first, kickoff or the toin cos?" And I would always get people to say the toin cos, like always. <laughs> <laughs> it Amazing. just like it's so. I don't know what it is, but. Maybe certain like certain uh, letters are kind of interchangeable sure. to the um, brain. Yeah. On that note, Clay, I'm I'm definitely stealing Dobbs and Niles, and I'm gonna write an episode. Should. Excellent. <laughs> just have, I, uh, Dobbs and Niles. I yep. won't even license it. You can just have it. Thanks, man. This week we're after Jack the Ripper. <laughs> That's nice of you. No customary uh, ten percent. I mean, oh yeah. <laughs> we're friends. We're friends here. I'll write him in. I'll write him in. <laughs> Um, uh, I want to I want to answer your I want to answer your question. Yeah. Um, you'd asked about like knobs and oh and tops and Niles and and tops and Niles. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm uh, I'm pretty much all in the box. Like I, I definitely have experimented with hardware at different times. Um, but I and it's fun. Uh, but I, it never it was never something that I kind of went really deep into. Um, it's an expensive hobby. Uh, if you're going to get yeah. into like Euro rack or something like that. Mm -hmm. And from a, from like a working musician standpoint, um, it's not the most practical thing, mm -hmm. um, to have, you know, to, to try to like do work on a much like a modular rig or something like that. Um, you know, there's, you, you don't have like, like patch recall or anything like that. So it's pretty, mm -hmm. you know, it's in that way, it's really cool. Cause it's so ephemeral and, you know, you know, it's like a, it's like a, like a like a sand painting or something but for like you know doing lots of different kinds of projects and stuff i always liked the flexibility of software and and also i think because i got really into um programming to kind of aid in that it sort of pushed me down that path even more and also i'm sort of i, I kind of like keeping my setup really minimal um i've experimented with like more complicated setups and i've had i've had like my own like a proper studio and you know all that kind of stuff but right now like my setup is it is very very basic like it is a desk and like a 61 key keyboard mm -hmm. to like you know desk like a desktop monitor type like they're they're not even that big and a laptop and that's like pretty much it so just try to um try to keep it simple and it makes it easier too to like work remotely when you don't your setup is not really changing that much so i guess it's an excellent point you, you certainly cannot drag the euro rack <laughs> wherever the 
hell you yeah. want. <laughs> well, some people yeah. have these little ones that are like eight eight units uh -huh. in the suitcase. Um, I mean, it's still still a heavy thing, but um, you know, they're they're fun. They're like I think they're inspiring creatively. Um, like a toy, I kind of think of it as a toy. Mm -hmm. um, not to say that you can't do serious work with it. It's just, um, I, I think because I've always been interested in flexibility and like kind of ex exploring different like avenues mm -hmm. um, more broadly. It's it, it hasn't necessarily been like the most practical kind of thing for me to have hardware really of, of any kind. Sure. Yeah, you're committing to a certain process when you when you work with that sort of stuff. And um, I mean. You know, there's obviously some leeway, but I mean, I think yeah. it has to be algorithmic by yeah. nature. It has to kind of evolve over time, the, the, the piece. It's mm -hmm. hard to kind of write things out, you know, in sections for, yeah. <laughs> for modules. I, I also think that the way that the way that I'm used to thinking about things like algorithms and stuff like that, it's easier for me to wrap my head around it if it's in code versus if it's a bunch yeah. of wires. Um, I, I, log, right? I, yeah, I find that that's maybe a little too um messy or something for me and i'm I maybe a little i'm a little too like ah, i want to make this neat <laughs> God, that's an understatement for for anyone in the audience who does not know what the hell we're talking about um these these modular bits of equipment basically turn into a switchboard for effects and sound <laughs> telephone and operator from the 50s yeah right exactly except that they then mix yeah. in some eldritch horror level of complexity yeah it's insane there is a there is a synthesizer shop in san francisco and they they always had this really cool print of it was Worf from star trek and he was in front of this massive like modular rig and he was like dialing it and i could never find a copy of it but i, I want it no so shit. bad like i would i would love a copy of it it's so cool because <laughs> that's, that's what it looks like it's looks like some yeah. spaceship it absolutely so. does and he um, had like a disapproving look on his face how do you, you know? know? Yeah, he's probably like, yeah. Yeah, that's Michael Cap Dorn. <laughs> Captain, <laughs> Captain, recommend we increase the frequency. No. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm they always just, wires. I'm blown away by, uh, and they, they, you're absolutely right. They look like it's it's straight out of like almost the, the original Star Trek with like the, yeah. uh, you know, you expect Uhuru to sit down and, and you know, drop some beats. <laughs> um, and give some super dreamy, uh, you know, whatever. But no, it always... Like I'm, I'm watching guys like uh, Amontaban or uh, Lapalox or Bonobo sit down in front of their UR rack and they'll just they they play and it's like I don't know how the fuck anyone or uh, Tom York I don't know how the hell you keep any of that clear in your brain. How do you know that that particular plug does this thing? It's just they've fun. all got engineers working for them that that figure all that shit out for. <laughs> Maybe not Amontaban. I don't know. He probably does it all himself. But Tom York. <laughs> it's always so I mean, crazy. I mean, it's crazy to me when like someone has a show and like they have one guitar for this song and like one instrument for this song and they're like bring me right. my you know bring me your rack number seven for this piece like <laughs> yeah. they must have like a like a airplane full of stuff like it's crazy right oh, sure. roadies like you know dragging out your rack setups that's hilarious <laughs> I, I feel like a, a, people a, I've a, seen yeah. using euro racks are mostly just you know, improvising, you know, and that, that they just kind of learn, you know, the setup based on that improvisation and that it's not, it's not really like, it's just kind of, you know, that's what their whole, you know, deal is. Do you know what I mean? Or did yeah. you guys cover this already? No, no, I think, I think it's you're just, right about that. Yeah. yeah, there are, yeah. Just, there are musicians is, who write, who write pieces and then will recreate them. But there's there's definitely a lot of um, there's a lot more variability I would say in like what comes out. <laughs> yeah, no, I guess what I mean is like um, if they're operating from a from a very loose structure, like if they you know I don't really have any experience with these modular you know Euro racks, so I can't really like give you technical examples. But you know if they have a loose structure and they're working with maybe three parameters, you know that they'll only work with for maybe like 20 seconds and then yeah. they'll add a fourth one and they have like a system, like, like their composition is composed like a system. Then that's, that's what I mean by like the kind of people I've seen using, using that stuff. Um, yeah. So they're not, you know, they're not like doing conventional composition, um, but you know, they want, 
they want to, you know, just kind of write a loose score out on paper, like in, you know, in a systematic way, right. you know, without using yeah. staff. Yeah. And then go perform it so that the very, they can build the variability into their mm -hmm. um, composition. Yeah, so, it's really, sure it's, it's really cool. Um, there's a, there was, yeah. a, there's an event. Um, there was some sort of event in LA, I can't remember the name of it, but basically it was like a modular meetup where people would go to the river and just sit on the bank of the river and um, anybody could, could show up and like do a set um, of modular. And it was always yeah. really wild because, you know, the, just the, the breadth of sounds that you would hear were just crazy. Um, and the only rule was that um, all of your modular gear had to be completely analog. <laughs> They're like no LED screens, no, no, no keyboards. Like, are you talking about like, downtown, on the river? Um, it was in it was in LA, like on the east side. Um, okay. Yeah, I used to do it. But they've moved it. I mean, I think they've had it at different locations. I think they've done it in Austin too. I can't remember the name of it, but it was pretty cool. We just joined in the chat by Jen, Jen de La Vega, an old, an old, uh, an old friend of uh, several oh, snap. of us. Oh, hey, Jen. <laughs> um, so maybe she has a question. We'll see. Um, so, um, Rich, I, I mean, we we kind of we covered a little bit of this, but I we didn't really talk in le at length about um, chip tune. I kind of was interested in your kind of the post mortem for you. I mean, you're still doing chip tune <laughs> chip related stuff, obviously. <laughs> But you know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. obviously, the, the era has changed a lot. The, things have changed so much. It's kind of hard to get your handle on what chiptune even is anymore. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, what do you... Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> Jen says, lol, postmortem. Um, <laughs> uh, I laugh, too. It's funny. Yeah. Um, so, but what what is your take on, like, what you got out of it? Like, what did... did yeah. Do you feel like it changed the way you composed? Do you feel like it... Oh, yeah. I don't know. Like, did, okay. You it was awesome. I that? mean, yeah, sure. I mean, it, it was really awesome. Um, it, it's wild to me that there are people who are still making chip tunes that I was, or, you know, making stuff alongside of. Like, I mean, it's been a really long time. Um, that's that's really cool. Uh, that's so not my personality. Um, like, I'm just, you know, kind of moving on to different things. Um, but uh, I would say that the compositional side because of the limitations of, of chiptune stuff, like where you're working with just a couple of voices, that really pushed yeah. me to get into counterpoint and learning it in a, in a non-traditional way. Because I, you know, I, I mean, I took some counterpoint classes, but you know, I had my own kind of sensibilities about what kind of notes, what kind of pitches I liked together. And working in this limited fr like format um, really kind of you know pushed me down that path. So I got really into into that stuff, voice leading and the compositional side. And it also allowed me to focus more on that than like on production. Not to say that there isn't production doing chip tunes, but it's much more, um, it was much more uh, approachable for me at that time to, to work with like more simple sounds. Um, so um, that was really, really, uh, valuable for me and, and beneficial, but also, you know, all the people that I met and, you know, playing live shows for like seven years um, was super amazing to, to be a part of a community. And also like one of the most like eclectic groups of people I, I think I've ever met and maybe ever will ever meet. I mean, it's just wild, like the, the breadth of people that were involved in that and, you know, maybe still are were involved in that space and like their, you know, the backgrounds are so wildly different, um, you know, ethnically, um, creatively, like in every, in every way. Um, and that was always really, really fascinating to me. Um, so I, know, I have nothing but good things to say about it. Awesome. In That's great. I'm glad to hear you mention the community because obviously that, I think for most people, that is the main, the main takeaway from chiptune is that it's, it's just a really big, warm family, at least for the most part. It's not always there. There's always <laughs> infighting in every. But, I mean, there is some. It, it, there's some funny. Yeah. Um, some funny like controversies from back in the day, like Crystal Castles and. Um, yes. Remember when people used to fake perform? Like that was a big thing that people got really mad about. Like people who were just like you know, 
<laughs> like do, do, like fake pressing buttons on keyboards. <laughs> right, but people would do it sometimes even just to play with you. You know, it was, it was yeah, awesome. Yeah, that's true. Um, I was I was on a uh, one of uh, I was lucky enough to have done some touring and stuff, obviously. And uh, Chiptune was great in that sense because it was a it was a worldwide phenomenon, it still is. And mm -hmm. um, you know, it was great to be able to go over to Europe and and play in like five different cities, you know. And um, mm -hmm. I remember we did a um, I guess it was the Blip Europe, the first Blip Europe. Um, I was lucky enough to be part of that lineup. And we played in um, Alborg, Denmark, Denmark, and um, we're kind of wandering around Alborg, and uh, it was I'm not I'm not gonna remember everybody. It was like nine people. So it was like, you know, Null Sleep, myself, Bit Shifter, Paris Triantafilis, the Visualist, um, uh, Minus Baby, uh, you know, um, Sasquatch. Uh, God, I'm trying to remember everybody. I'm almost there. I got. I know all those people. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jeremy Colesign. Uh, anyway, but but um, we were wa wandering down the street, and it was like we'd already split into these multiple groups out of the nine, like three and three and three, or like you know six and three, and like it was either based on like who were the drinkers and who were the pot smokers, or you know <laughs> who wanted to do this, and who, wanted to do that. who were like the chill people, and who were the aggressive. You know, let's go out and party. This morning, and, uh, woke up in the at some point, wow, at some point, um, uh, Jeremiah turned to me. We're walking down the street at no sleep, turned to me and said, you know, we're part of a pretty weird group of people. <laughs> and it's like, it really struck me. Like, yeah, this is like I what, what other music genre would bring this unusual collection of people together? you know, to tour. Yeah. It was, it was kind of fascinating. I feel like I, I have a theory about this, which is that like um, the, the distance between weirdos is much greater than the distance between like the average, you know, average people maybe. So like, even mm -hmm. though like it's maybe like some sort of like category, the actual like, you know, the, the, everyone is like their own like universe, like in, in some mm -hmm. respect. So there's like just a, there's like a vibe to that. That's really kind of, fascinating <laughs> yeah yeah it's great i mean going to something like magfest or, or eight static festival or even blip festival was really enlightening to me because i got to meet people who's basically like their brain brain architecture seemed totally different from mine you know <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like wow, people think like this that's kind of fascinating mm -hmm. um, <laughs> excellent. that's really cool so do what uh, what's coming up? Do you have anything uh, lined up uh, for the future that you can tell us about? Is it all hush hush still? I'm working on um, a, a um, independent game right now. I just started working on it. It's called Paradise Marsh. Um, it's nice to work on something small and and kind of kind of fun. A bit of a throwback. Um, it's sort of like a procedurally generated marsh that you that you explore um, and you like you like collect awesome. bugs <laughs> basically. Um, so it's sort of like a sort of opportunity to like get really deep into doing some like environmental music and, and systems and kind of sink my teeth into something fun and interactive. Um, so that's something that I'm working are on. These, are these people that you've worked with before? Is it a new uh, contact? It's a new, it's just a new person. Um, okay. It's two other people. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. I've kind of been like trying to simplify some of my collaborations um because i i tend to like them better when they're simple <laughs> so i, I yeah. seem to gravitate towards like the projects where i'm only working with a handful of people yeah that's that is the big one of the big differences i imagine between uh working on a video game soundtrack and a, and a film soundtrack M many less cooks yeah. in the kitchen yeah mm -hmm. um jen by the way jen says you went from collecting snowflakes with your tongue to bugs yeah, it's it's the same. I don't know. <laughs> there was other stuff in between. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah. If um, this is my last game, yes, that will be that will be like the the, the byline of my obituary or something. <laughs> yeah, right. That's perfect. So like For some books. reason, you hate this game. Um, <laughs> do you have a, oh, do you have a great. preferred so, um, kind of? Genre, like what's what's the genre of game or of, of movie, whatever the, the case is, that you 
prefer that you just be like man this is my my happy place my sort of warm cup of tea um my preferred genre is um it's things that uh feel right to me at the particular time that i do it um there's no okay. preferred genre it's just my uh, own weird blend of like what you know what would be cool um what would be different um what makes sense for me right now um there's there's definitely things that i have tried to avoid okay um yeah i i think you know i i tend to try to avoid things that are too similar to things that i've already done um you know but my, but my motivations change over time and i'm not really like in the same sort of like super ambitious place that i was when i was younger mm -hmm. and now i'm more interested in like um sharing knowledge and working on small things that are fun and um uh and working through my massive backlog of personal projects um i definitely like you know there are certain kinds of things that i like i i like games that are funny um i like things that are funny i like sports um i like i do like genre stuff um that's not too like i guess um Please you know it. gory oh, okay. gory or yeah I, I don't know i'm uh you obviously had a fondness for spaghetti westerns at some point. Yeah, I was gonna say I like westerns. I like samurai movies. You know, I like some mafia movies. Like I, I like genre movies um, in general. I guess uh, I like period. I think I have things that are set in like particular periods are interesting. Like mm -hmm. especially if they're, you know, some particular part of the past. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I think one of the early. Uh, <laughs> One of the uh, one of the conversations we haven't really had that many conversations because I think we've been in the same room together a number of times, but we've only really spoken a, num a couple of times. Yeah. But I do remember I can't remember if this is online or in person, but we talked about Ennio Morricone at some point um, and both of us being totally fascinated with his uh, obvious genius. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is there to say besides he's great, was great. Um but yeah, I, I remember yeah. you you did uh, we well we both covered at the time we both covered uh, various. Well, actually, did you you never covered a Morricone? Did you you did your own kind of spaghetti western? Type yeah, I had stuff. I had a I had a split EP that I did with Darius Carlin, um, that was right. West, western themed. It was called West, and uh, I had a track called The Outlaw, and he had a track called The Sheriff. <laughs> yeah, and it was awesome. very Morricone themed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I think yeah, I think exactly. Darius Carlin's track even had like a. Ooh, 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 in it. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> but I just love like a, a, like just a it's like a it's like they invented a entirely new genre of music out of thin air I mean I, I know that it's not thin air but to someone who's not from Italy like mm -hmm. it just it felt that way when I when I first heard it and I was like this is amazing and it's funny how it, it's the sound of westerns even though it's Italian I mean obviously it's totally arbitrary <laughs> Yeah, it is. Yeah, it feels it's totally like, arbitrary, but it worked so well. It's amazing. Yeah, right. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that stuff. Um, Me too. I mean, the first time, I remember when I was in college, the first time I heard the electric guitar in Once Upon a Time in the West, it just blew mm -hmm. my mind. It's like, what? You know, this is like, at first it was sort of like, well, this is a really dated electric guitar sound. Like, they had, the world had already moved on to, like, Hendrix and all this other stuff, you know? Right. But anymore, <laughs> when you out like this really dated kind of fuzz box kind of you know like literally a fuzz box right like uh -huh. a you know harder, <laughs> you know unit that the guitar is plugged into and it just it it was so abrasive and intense and it just it works so beautifully in that score uh, and then in the meantime you've got like these full-on orchestral pieces and like you know um and choir pieces kind of blending in with the guitar and then you got banjo and like all these other things. Um, yeah, it struck me as like a, an amazing world. It was probably the first time I really thought about film music was when I heard that score. And then yeah. I went to see the movie, like when they, I guess they, um, uh, yeah, it was uh, actually, it was when they remastered, what's it called? Um, what are they, when they take a movie and they, Jesus, I can't believe I've forgotten this. Um, anyway, Scorsese over. Um, well, they didn't remake it, but they they took it and they just re -remastered. Re remastered. Yeah, they uh, they, they, they cleaned it up. Yeah, they cleaned it up, uh, kind of remastered, but 
there, there's another more technical word for it in film. Like restored. restored. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Scorsese oversaw the restoration of Once Upon a Time in, in the West. Oh, cool. And I saw it. And I saw it at uh, Lincoln Center, and I was just like, "Oh my god!" And Scorsese came out on stage and, and introduced Whoa, it. That's so cool. And he was like, he looked like he had had a couple too many lines, but you know, he was uh, <laughs> otherwise in pretty good. <laughs> he was really kind of nervous. I'm talking about Scorsese I'm like, is a cokehead. Right <laughs> oh, dude. read up a little bit. Yeah, um, I think he's yeah. I think he's he's pretty settled down now. He's an older guy, but he, he you know he he, he, room, he, was, he was Robbie Robertson's roommate in in uh, where was that L.A. I guess right. I don't know where the hell they live, but a lot of you know, Robbie Robertson, huh? the guitarist from the band, they were they were sure. roommates. Um, so <laughs> yeah, there was some there was some drug use. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, but it was it was amazing, and I, I saw it on the big screen in Dolby surround sound, and it was just oh my god, it blew me away, and I was just like, this is. This is what a film soundtrack is. You know, I understand now, you know, the difference between a film soundtrack and these pop records that I've been buying, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Chris yeah. was baptized. Uh, so what's, what's your baptism? What's your, hey, here's the moment. Oh, Riches, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you have a, in film, in what, for what, film or? In, in general, when you had that that click yeah. moment of holy shit, that's the sound. That's that's what I want to replicate or and give people that sensation or whatever the case is. I feel like everyone who who gets into something creative has some moment where they go, "This is the thing that drives me in the middle of the night when I think all my stuff is garbage." No, I want to still continue to do that one thing. You mean specifically for film? No, or just in, in, music? in general, like just, m music for you musically. What? hit that switch what ignited that spark prog <laughs> i think it, i think it probably was prog yeah i mean i think because all things are prog. Uh, <laughs> in the beginning like guitar and like riffs there's something about riffs that i was just like fascinated by um when mm -hmm. i was in high school and i was listening to like rage and tool i mean that was <laughs> yep. i mean that was like my happy place so mm -hmm. Um, everything that I've done, I think, comes out of that. Uh, that sort of like, I mean, there is also like a, some sort of foundation of the music that I listened to ambiently growing up because of my parents. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that that also kind of came into play. But as far as that, like, the music that makes you make that, you know, that like, mm, that like face, you know, mm. Mm, yeah, <laughs> like that was the music. Like that was really what got me going. And yeah, I mean, that's how I started making music was playing guitar and coming up with riffs and. You know, drop D and odd meters, pentatonics, all that kind of stuff. That's where it started. <laughs> Thank yes. you, boy, but you still also um, you still play guitar a bit. I I noticed actually you had you did a collab with uh, Grant Henry. Is that right? Yeah. Or was that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was like pretty recent. I mean, like you know, like I don't know, maybe five years ago or something. Five or six years Four ago. Years ago. Well, Grant. Um, yeah. has a really large he was a really huge influence on me um because i stumbled across metroid metal back in like 2003 when i was just like starting to play guitar and i was like this is so cool um you know these prog like metal covers of metroid um and i never mm -hmm. even really played metroid but i just thought the music was so amazing and um that community him specifically and the community really was one of the things that motivated me to make music. There was that community. There was also the Mini Bosses community, um, the, uh, the the video game cover band from Arizona. They had like a really active message board with a ton of future, well-known game composers who were hanging out there. Uh, they had, you know, there was this thing called Dwelling O Duels, which was like a, a a video game cover competition that would happen like every month. Um, and there'd always be like a different theme and a lot of it was like shredding basically, <laughs> but some people would do slightly different things. And, you know, it, it was, that was really, that was really where I kind of sunk my teeth into making stuff mm -hmm. and sharing, like sharing music with other people, seeing what they think of it. Mm -hmm. Um, just having like a peer group. So, you know, I owe, I owe a lot to Grant. Um, and yeah, I, 
I yeah. awesome. played the guitar. Guitar was my first instrument. Um, it's the instrument I went to Berkeley with. I'm not a great guitar player. Um, I see it more as like a something that I pick up if I have an idea and I try to like, you know, noodle it out. And, you know, I've used it at various times. I did a I did a guitar soundtrack for a game called Shoot Many Robots back in the day. Um, and uh, I, there's there's guitar on Triple Frontier. Um, but, you know, I kind of go through phases with guitar. Um, I mm -hmm. right. These days I'm more, I tend to play the piano a lot more than I play guitar, but, um, but yeah. You're getting old, Rich. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> these, these hands, they can't handle, can't handle the, the pain of <laughs> I remember at one point there was talk on one, I don't know, APC someplace. I don't remember where. And you were part of it, a discussion APC. about a possible King, King Crimson uh, cover release, oh, chiptune shit. cover release. And I did, you, I mean, Tamara and I actually covered Red um, and did it live a number of times. The track the or song. the whole album? Okay. The, the track. Oh, no, the, the track. song. Yeah. <laughs> I have a, I, my, one of my exes drew me the, the cover, the cover art for that album. Uh, I've had it for like oh, cool. 15 years or something because <laughs> it was one of the cool. albums that really inspired me when I was when I was young. Um, yeah. When I was first getting into like classic prog, like that was the album that I was like yeah. way, <laughs> way into. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I can understand that. But you never did a King Crimson cover in, in the end. No, but there are a couple of songs that are very King Crimson-y that yeah. I've done. Yeah, definitely. I've definitely noticed that. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. I mean, not in a bad way, in a, in a great way, like where it's just like a mild influence, obviously, and not, you know, an overt kind of thing. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I mean, we've talked about time signatures and it's uh, what fun it is to, you know, to to kind of concoct something that could be a relatively simple melody, but, you know, throw it into this weird environment of uh, 11, eight or something like that or 10, <laughs> eight. Or, yeah, it's super fun becomes really interesting um it always blew my mind when I, I like find you know like just watch these guys like that you know just whatever playing together the prog bands from back then i saw an awful lot of them i remember seeing like general giant and king crimson and genesis oh, cool. and yeah cool. all of those bands. I was, that was like I, my general giant the videos i've seen of them live were like insane they seemed like oh very it's unbelievable tight band mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Tam Tamara and I have this joke where we watch. I can't remember which track. I think it's um, on Reflection. The big. It's actually a madrigal with the four vocalists singing at the same time. Oh wow! Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, when, then they at some a certain point they are still singing the madrigal, but they're playing instruments as well. And Whoa. the bass player is is playing a different part of the madrigal on his bass while he's singing. <laughs> you know, it's like, holy cow! Singing one part, a different one. I mean, and it and totally like the bass like this. <laughs> it looks like he's having a, a stroke or something like he's singing yeah. but his face is it's stuck in guitar face the entire God. time wonder of wonders There's some, his, his yeah. brain i'm sure is split right down the middle and one side is doing one yeah. thing the other side is doing the other there's some yeah, amazing Ray videos Schultz. of the drummer too just like he who John looks Weathers. he just looks like he's like stoned out of his yeah. mind and he's like doing this yeah. like crazy like you know but he's so tight, and he's like, "Yeah, he's really feeling it." Oh, it's so cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll never understand. Yeah, he the had a special who part. Can also sing because mm. you're you're oh, talking yeah, about right. how much that like stuff that goes on your diaphragm has just got to get squished the whole time. There's no way I could keep right. a constant uh, tone, a constant timbre, a constant volume. The quality of my voice mm. would be all mm. over the damn map. A lot of practice. Yeah. Clearly, uh, and, and both, both hands, core. both feet, and your yeah. I work yeah, with a few not. singing drummers, and they tend to get to a point where the drumming doesn't become secondary, but it becomes like course of nature. Like what they're doing with their limbs is so practiced yeah. that they don't, they're not thinking about that. They're thinking, I about can't walk, Mike. I can't walk. I, I know. So... I, 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 I've tried to train you, but you know, you just don't listen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very cool. I don't know how much time you got, Rich. We've we've uh, kept you here quite a while. Um, I really appreciate your being part oh, yeah. of this discussion. Um, does anybody have any other final questions for for Rich? Oh, yes, I do. I um, I I'm just curious. Like, do you 
how often do you sketch? Do you do you sketch like every day, or do you, you know, do you kind of like um, like you were taught earlier the process of, you know, sounding and and just writing, you know, phrases and things to come while you're writing some other stuff, and then you kind of save that as part of your sketchbook. Or I'm just curious. Like um, yeah. I'm always interested in you know composers' processes. I'm I'm very. Um... I kind of work in waves, so I'll get into a headspace and I'll, you know, I'll be at it every day maybe for a while. Then there are times when I don't do any writing for, I'm, I might go months without writing. Like the last couple of years, I've gone really some really long periods without doing any writing and been focusing on other things, whether it's like putting together an album of music I've already written or working on technical stuff or just taking a break completely. Um, but I do, you know, there are there have been periods where you know I, I try to just sometimes I'll just sit down and play the piano with no particular intention in mind. Sometimes it's like therapeutic. Sometimes I, it's a little more intellectual, and I'm like stumbling onto potential ideas that I can record and save for later. I do have like a really large database of just like you know ideas mm -hmm. from over the years, and uh, it's nice because I can go back and kind of like pull things out and like oh this might be perfect for this thing or, or whatever. Um, so yeah. I, I definitely yeah, don't I, have I, like a workman sort of quad, like approach to it. I'm very like, mm, I, I kind of, I'm kind of watery about it. Like I kind of go in waves. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds healthier to be honest <laughs> than, you know, putting, works for me. I mean, a little work life balance. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, when you have a project and a deadline, like that's mm. one thing, but just, yeah, you know, like, being a creator and just, you know, pressure versus, you know, trying to, you know, follow your own rhythms, so to speak, is, is really um, that negotiation. I think, I think you're yeah. right. Like, it's really about, like, fi figuring out your own rhythm. I mean, and I think for some people, maybe what I do kind of thing would, would work and other people, maybe not so much. I mean, I know, like, Leonard Cohen, for instance, used, right. to, he used to, like, wear a suit and, like, go to, like, you know, where he, where he would write and he would do that every day. And I know Billy Joel used to do something similar. Like he was like, it was like a job. Like he would go to the studio and he'd write every day and, you know, it wouldn't, you know, it just maybe yeah. be good, maybe not. Um, and that's like a totally, you know, cool, viable way to work too. Um, but uh, I get, you know, I, I go through phases where I'm just not that interested in it and I'd rather be doing something else. So that's just me personally. Yeah. Do you know the uh, Do you know the story about Leonard Cohen meeting Bob Dylan and talking about the composition <laughs> process? It's a good no. story. One of my favorite. Yeah, <laughs> it's very short. Um, <laughs> so it was something like this. I'm probably forgetting some of it, but it was something like this. Um, oh yeah, you know, nice to meet you, Mr. Dylan, uh, Bob. Okay, um, I really love that song, "Blowing in the Wind." How long did it take you to write that? He said, I don't know, it's like probably 20 minutes, a half an hour or something a day. And then and he says, yeah, you know, Bob says, I really love that song. Hallelujah, Leonard. It's it's really beautiful. And um, I wondered often how long it took you to write that. And he said, five years banging my head against the floor in a hotel room. <laughs> Sometimes those two stories happen in the Poor same guy. person, too. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sometimes it just comes out. Yeah. Sometimes it's like, this is impossible. I like, don't know how to finish mm -hmm. this. The best thing for me ever as a composer yeah. was the 48-hour challenge on 8-Bit Collective. It was mm -hmm. so useful. It was like, okay, I'm going to take Those 48 hours only and make you something, know, you know? I, I'm finally getting to a place now where I might have enough time to actually do like a 30 songs in 30 days type challenge again. Really? I, I used to be, like, I used I did that one time, maybe like, a long time ago um and uh, mm -hmm. that was so valuable and fun um i didn't mm -hmm. i did not do 30 days um i think i managed like 17 or 18 but i mean mm. it was Have you, were you part of um, god i'm totally forgetting the name of the site uh tamra help me out here tim lambs um oh uh, uh oh. chipmusic.org well yeah but i mean the the, the specifically we, the, weekly uh, beats um oh, weekly oh yeah beats. yeah yeah. Um, yeah, which I, is one. I don't think I ever did that one. I'm familiar yeah, with it. That's now. that's also a, a fun. Yeah. I guess it's a little bit looser. Like you don't have to do it. You know, you do it weekly, but 
you yeah. know, you can kind of <laughs> you know, catch up, you know. Um, yeah, it's, I, I wish, I wish I was doing that now. I, I really, I, you know, podcast production is a little too grueling, unfortunately, for, for uh, my attempting that. She's a cruel um, mistress, Chris. But, she, she, she's a cruel she demands, mistress. <laughs> demands payment. If you're not, if you're oh not my bleeding. God. <laughs> I, mean, I know all of you have definitely come to that point where you sit down and you bring everything up and you've got all the, the tracks laid out and you look at it and go, ah, nope. I've, like, <laughs> I've been asked before to work on podcasts and as soon as I start getting into it, I'm like, no, this is, no. This is too much for me. Well, too audio grueling. Drama, audio drama is even worse. I mean, you literally you're doing everything. Yeah. As, as a production, yeah. you know, the yeah. whole thing. You're just you, literally doing all the work. Yeah, <laughs> yes. all of it. Uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Thankfully, there's a cast that I can rely on to do actually do the part, play the parts. <laughs> right, um, but then you've got to mix everything too, and that, oh. Yeah. I mean, I love it, you know, and I think, I was, I was you know. To say, and, Chris, we wouldn't do it if we didn't yeah. enjoy it. There's, oh yeah, no there's, doubt. there's yeah, maybe yeah. some masochism mm -hmm. involved in that, but there's still some joy. There, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Totally. <laughs> Another kind of contribution. Um, but anyway, thanks again, Rich, for, for being here. I really appreciate it. I know as soon as you get off, I'm going to think of a thousand questions I didn't ask you, but we got to call it at some point. Um, yeah. So uh, I'll, please stay in touch. Have and, me back. I'll yeah. come back. <laughs> All right. Happy to do. Go. It's fun to hang out. Excellent. Thanks yeah. so much. We'll talk to you soon, I'm yeah. sure. Awesome. All right. Take Good care, to see man. you all. Thanks, man. Take care. Thanks. Yeah. Bye, Rich. Um, I really wanted to ask him. I want to mention. <laughs> the what? Hey, cool. His what? hair. His hair was amazing. Dude, his hair was amazing. It was uh, very nice. Yeah, yeah that's, a good, that nice that's, that's a good question. Um, I, I want to I want to make one announcement uh, two announcements actually um, one is that uh, there's a show coming up at Wonderville um, on uh, September 4th which is about a week from Saturday is yes, that correct next, week, next weekend right not yes. this one but the one after yeah yeah and it's a, a, a well it's a partly it's a chiptune crowd show. The people who are in, who are involved are chiptune based, but not all of them are playing chiptune at the show. Um, and our, our own corset lore is uh, is on the on the bill and going to be yeah. playing live. Nice. Her own her own specific, and she's got a yeah. wonderful record that she's working on, and we I can't wait to hear it and see it um, come out. You doing a full um, set? So that is at. Yep. Yeah. Nice. Uh, what? Yeah. He said. Yeah, I you, hope. Doing I hope by the end. Actually, no. I'm definitely releasing it by the end of the year. There's just no. Hopefully this fall. <laughs> but um, it's. But it is like um, Chris. Just to um clarify, you mentioned chip tune and then chip tune kind of related things. So, um, it's a chip tune and digital fusion show. That's kind of like, okay. what people are referring to to the chip adjacent you know um mm -hmm. idea as i think at this point yeah awesome so yeah so yes. it'll be so, so people should either um uh please come out to wonderville that's why this is so so exciting because it's um a an rl show it's in real life so um, come out to this. It's also going to be streaming. Damn, say, um, we York. have. If I was uh, in New York, I'd be there. Yeah, it's a little bit of a, a yeah. trip, bit of a hike. Well, okay. Well, people in the chat, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you guys can watch the stream if you want. Oh, absolutely. Well, um, we'll be streaming, uh, and um, we'll have um, Chris Kaiser performing, who's like a chip tune vet from New York uh, City. And we have um, Business Pastel, Wendy, she's great, she's awesome. And we have um, Demonic Sweaters, and that's really exciting. Um, Justin's music is really interesting. It's like experimental chip and synth uh, with drums that he plays live. So, um, yeah. So, um, and that'll be streaming. Right here, actually, on Wonderville NYC. 
twitch.tv slash Wonderville NYC uh, next Saturday. And the yeah. show starts at, do you remember the time? Um, Is it 7? I think doors are at 7. Yeah. Doors at 7, so probably music at 8 or something uh, p.m. Eastern time. Yeah. Or somewhere there about uh, mm -hmm. maybe 7.30. Um, cool. Yeah, and the other 30. announcement uh, is that uh, is that we're moving our Twitch stream to our own account. Um, hopefully next week. We right? Is that is that the plan? Uh, hell, <laughs> he or hell or high water. Hell or high water. Hell or high water. We move it. That, it, that it may be, be um, a, a little rough around the edges. Our first time out, um, but we it will be twitch.tv slash mandible judy. Yeah, um, and um, have that on yeah. lockdown. <laughs> and uh we will be um we're, we're you know we're working on the format a bit we're going to do some new stuff and uh we got lots of plans uh for the coming uh, fall uh, streams so thanks for being here everybody and thank you so much to wonderville uh it's just been you know the best uh possible professional relationship with those guys uh, mark Lieb is is wonderful he's wonderville wonderful and um <laughs> And just love being there in, in real life as well. And thankfully, those of us in New York can continue to go there in, in real life. And those of us not in New York can continue to log in mm. to their Twitch stream. Um, Monday nights especially are really fun with um, Matt Hawkins' Fort 90 stream, which is rare, weird movies and Japanese media and anime and all kinds of insane stuff. Um, machinima. It's like all over the place. Mm. Um, so that's a super fun event. Uh, so do continue to ch uh, check out Wonderville NYC. Um, so what do you guys got to say for yourselves? I'm so ashamed. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, I've, look, here's Glenn. Just I've as we it. sign off. Right. Nice. Perfect Mark, timer. Uh, oh, it's timing. Glenn. Wow. Dean. Glenn, maybe. Hi, uh, Glenn. Be, uh, Hi, well, everybody. next time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're a late, man. We were literally, we were literally just saying goodbye. Oh, hey, look, it's him. It's him in a car. I am in a car. Is it a new car? It's oh, like, like oh, this game's still going on. Let me check in and say hi. So I have. It's bye. Okay. It's light there. Bye. Where the hell are you? <laughs> he's in. He's oh, he's visiting. Oh, uh, San Diego. Yeah. San Diego. Yeah. San Diego. So nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's the well, right what? on. I visited oh, nice where you are. Time, like, uh, last month. I haven't been down to San Diego yet. I finally got down there like last month. I just finally got to go hiking in Joshua Tree. It was beautiful. Nice. Excellent. What are you up to right now? <laughs> Driving home and drinking red wine. <laughs> Hopefully, Hopefully not, not simultaneously. simultaneously. <laughs> no. Driving home... Then drinking red wine then, while doing something. Understood. Nicely done. Uh, what's your Kids what's your what's your flavor? Drink. Yeah, don't drink and drive. No. Uh, what do you mean? What's my flavor? Uh, cab, <laughs> Shiraz. Rosé. Uh, I like Shiraz, but I think what I have with me is a cab. Mm. Spicy. It'll do. That'll do. That'll do, pig. That'll do. <laughs> That'll Have do. a nice sauvignon. It gets you drunk. Out of a box. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Hey, I was only 10 20, so I can't. Don't ask me. Mad dog. Well, wh I... scotch whiskey is more my thing, but I, th I think I just like picked up a bottle of red just for something different. We had a wonderful uh, scotch with Glenn in Philly. Do you remember that, Tamara? What was that? What? It was a wonderful what? Scotch. Scotch. It was or called was it oh, Airstone. We didn't hear that. It was called Airstone. A E R S T O N E, I think. Hardbag. Okay. Oh, oh yeah. Bag. You guys so not I, hear yeah. me? No. All right. No, yeah. You, I you're might lagging a little bit. out, so I, I don't know if you hear yeah. me or not. No, it's, it, you're just lagging a little bit. It's okay. I can hear you now. Um, yeah. Our bag is, yeah, that was good stuff. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Ardbeg, big fan of Lafroy. Mm -hmm. Single or, or I feel like I was blended? Scared. Single. I wish I liked yeah. it. I gotta I gotta find a single I like. The the peat is super it's it's super peaty. 
it's very campfire, and I can't get into it. But the blended, for whatever reason, is just it's smooth and it works. My, for me, the smokier, the peatier, the, the, just like the, the closer to a leather shoe that I can get, is the, <laughs> is my my preferred flavor. <laughs> So I have... If it smells like I'm drinking a campfire with gasoline, then fair, it's a fair good I'm going to like. Uh, I have a friend whose dad is a professional scotch taster. Uh, I don't know, sommelier, I guess you call that. But up to and including the point that uh, scotch breweries or, or distilleries will hire him to like write the, you know, the notes, the descriptions of what each of these things are. And when I was over there not uh, that far out of high school, I was – just leafing through things that were just on their their dresser, uh, not in a creepy way, just in a I'm standing around waiting for whatever to happen. Right, through their stuff. Yeah. Exactly right. And uh, I found some of his notes, and one of them is, he goes, uh, I don't remember what the hell the scotch was, but it tastes pleasantly of horse sweat and shoe leather. Uh, and I was like, that's I don't know that I want to have that. But now that I'm older and I've, I've had enough scotch, I'm like, oh, no, I get where that comes from. Like, if, mm. give me a drink that tastes like old library dust, and I'm in it. Give me that. I think it's a very interesting choice of particular animals. Wet. Yeah, specifically a horse. I like that. It's not quite a cow. It's more like more like a horse. Well, so... Yeah. Have, have you ever been around like a, a bunch of farm animals? No. I grew up on a farm. Okay. So horses have a very like distinct, workers. extraordinarily distinct uh, sweat smell. Very different from cow, very different from camel. Horse sweat is horse sweat. And people who... It's not quite donkey. No, it's not, not donkey. Not quite donkey. It's just horse. It's between cow and... It's like, it's like right there between, uh, you know, where you're talking about... <laughs> You get your thoroughbreds, you got like your uh, your greyhounds, okay, and then in between there, you've got horse sweat, and that's really what you want, right? If uh, if after you're done mucking out the stall, right, and then you like rub your face with the thing that you just rubbed your horse down with, it's you know, you get to like it. You know, the ladies they really like that. There's just a certain uh, potpourri about it. <laughs> That's the yeah, real we're, we're still broadcasting, <laughs> huh? Absolutely still broadcasting. Said, said, uh, are we? We're still live. Yes. Oh, yeah. We're still on. Yeah, we're live, baby. We are alive. As live as we'll ever be. <laughs> do, we, do we end on a high I note? I forgot. Do we end there? Before you guys. I think we end on Yeah. Twitter. Let's call it. I mean, Twitch. Glenn shows up. That, you know. We, we love you. We'll see you next week. Tuesday, Twitch. Chris? Are we going Tuesday or are we staying, we're staying Thursday? Just typing, I'm just, um, hang on. I'm just typing in Twitch. We're sorry. I'm not <laughs> sorry. Chris is sorry. I'm not sorry. We went wrong. We went wrong. Um, <laughs> let's, uh, no, next week we can do Thursday still. Okay. All right. Um, let's do Thursday next week on our channel and then maybe we'll make the switch one. Does that make sense? Let's yeah. talk this over. Not the stream yes. <laughs> Bye -bye. <laughs> okay uh, thanks so much you guys we love you love Twitch. you all See yeah you. bye thanks twitch